Welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. Episode tonight is number 345, recorded on tax day. Well, at least in the United States, April 15th, 2015. I'm going to be your host for this evening, Josh Walrath. I've got another four weeks before I have to submit, and I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I submitted today, and I'm broke, and I'm Alan Malventano. I also submitted today, and I'm also broke, and I'm Sebastian Peak. Well, then, it seems all of our money has gone to people who may or may not need it. But anyway, yeah, my uh, tax bill was only 34 bucks, which Lucky didn't you. suck. Mm. What? Lucky you. Well, yeah, it's because of the two children, three dogs, and two cats. You're not you supposed to claim, claim dogs and cats. <laughs> They're dependent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You I mean, know what? They're completely dependent. They're office supplies, yeah. okay? Oh, I see. I need them for the show. They eat the office material. supplies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, you know, you can get a hold of us at podcast at pcper.com. Email us. Tell us what you think. Ask questions. We may or may not get to them depending on the week. Or Ryan just might ignore you because I have no access to that, which is probably a good thing. You can uh, see us on every time uh, you want, whenever you want, at uh, pcper.com slash podcast. We usually have these up about a day after they're recorded, and you have a whole list going back to something like, what, 135 or lower? I think it goes back to like 72. I need to dig back in the archives to find the nice. first few. It goes back to the day the raid died. I think yeah. we have all that data, because Alan recovered it. I did. Good God. I expertly I recovered that raid. Yeah. Do you have those lost original 30-some episodes? I, that I was th- on that raid. I think they're somewhere. I'll have to look. Like, they would have been somewhere on that raid. <laughs> but I wasn't only, there, so... That's probably a know, good thing. Wasn't yeah, important. I, I sent back like a four terabyte drive with that recovered raid on it. I thought you copied it onto the array. It, they just haven't been posted online. Like when we moved oh. to S3, they never got transferred over. I see. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, you can also follow Ryan on Twitter. Twitter.com slash Ryan Shroud or Twitter.com slash PC Per... The rest of the boys here, I think, have uh, Twitter accounts. Look us up if you're the least bit willing or wanting to. Uh, you can join our spam list at pcper.com slash subscription. Ken is the only person who has access to it, and uh, he's got a lot of your other personal information as well, so it's a win-win for him. But on your side, at least, you get to know when we're having interviews, shows, giveaways, and knowing we have we have the podcast every week. No, uh, no comment, Ken. How's that Lamborghini you bought? Oh, on it's the back great. Of yeah, our listeners it's definitely. Yeah, it uh, handles well on the snow and the ice. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we've had uh, you know pretty decent uh, week in terms of reviews. I think there's one person who is a little heavy and uh, makes everybody else look bad, but in a good way. Don't talk and about so, Alan like that. Well. Okay, there's two people that make us look bad. Okay, maybe three. But anyway. I uh, love so nothing. <laughs> you're the news hound. <laughs> the first review, uh, I believe Ryan wrote this up, the MSI GS30 Shadow Review. It's a notebook and a GPU gaming dock. I believe that Sebastian did some editing on this and talked to Ryan extensively about it, so I'm going to let him take it away. Thanks, Josh. No, while thank was, you. While, while I was down in Kentucky, I got to look at this thing, and I've seen a few of these. You know, it's a notebook that's standalone, but then you can dock it to an external video card. So obviously the, the idea is you get home and you plug it in, and now you can game on it like a desktop. And it looks like a bread box. It's a big box that you set it on. There's a PCI Express connector that will connect the two, so it's a full PCIe uh, I don't remember how many lanes it has, or 16. if we knew that. Is it full 16? 16? Yeah, it was by 16. 16. Nice. So it does not come with a video card, correct? The box comes with a power supply, but no, but no GPU. Correct. I think and, there might be some retailer deal right now that does that, but I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Yeah, maybe maybe Newegg had that. Um, but the the laptop itself, it's a Haswell Core i7. It's the 4870HQ. It's using Iris Pro graphics. So there's no discrete graphics on this particular laptop until you dock it. 
16 gigs of uh, RAM. It's a high density display for 13 inches, fairly high. It's 1920 by 1080, so it's a full 1080p display. Um, two Kingston M.2 drives and a RAID 0. And kind of your usual Ultrabook specs otherwise. But obviously the big difference here is that PCI Express connector and the dockability. Um, I will say in using this just as a laptop, because it is kind of a thin and light design, it, I'm, I don't know if it was just how aggressively they tuned the fan or the thermal, the thermals they were trying to get with the i7, but the fan got quite loud and it got loud quickly. So I don't know if that could be changed with a firmware update, but this thing was one of the loudest notebooks I've ever heard. And however, I mean, the, the, the processing power in it, you can kind of understand because they're basically repl replicating a desktop here. This is a very small desktop replacement at 13 inches. And you're dealing with a, a full high end Haswell chip in here. The synthetic benchmarks results are very impressive. It's going to blow away anything with a core M in it. Um, and then gaming results. What video card did Ryan use with the bread box? It was a uh, MSI 980. Okay. So really that i7 is not going to stand too much in the way of the performance of that card with a full by 16 connection. I believe it's only PCI 2.0 though. Oh. But that's not going to make a huge difference unless nah, I'm wrong. I barely notice. Yeah, I don't remember specifically, I guess. Yeah. yeah. The integrated yeah, versus dock slide is pretty funny. I mean, there's you can go out and compare, you know, a GTX 980 versus other video cards in some of these game benchmarks, but it jumps from in grid two on ultra settings that the 1080p, like the native panel, 17.7 jumps up to 136.4. And it's mm -hmm. kind of the same thing across the board. You're getting well over 100, up to like 170 frames a second in Crisis 3. And obviously that's going to depend on which video card you put in here. Um, the power supply in that box was powerful enough to put just about anything in there. I think my uh, R9-290X Lightning card is the most power-hungry video single GPU video card I've ever used. And it recommends like a 550, I think. And it has two 8-pin and one 6-pin connector on it. But if you're not putting that in there, I think you could put pretty much any other single GPU video card in here. And you're also not... Well, I guess you are powering the laptop because it does charge through that. But you have more headroom because you're not powering the entire like 4770K, just like standalone CPU. So the 500 watts stretches a little bit further because more is going to directly to the GPU. Since okay. It's a lower end yeah. processor or and lower nothing GPU is going processor. to the integrated screen since it doesn't work when you're docked. Yes. For some yeah, I mean that's less than reason. 90 watts for that entire laptop at at full when hard drives are going, screens going, all that. So yeah, you've got some. You got some leeway. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that detail. You you have to have a dedicated monitor for this. You can't just plop it down on this. It would be almost impossible to use. You'd have to kind of move some things around your desk, maybe have a taller chair. I don't know how you'd even use this. Also, you know, none of the ports on the laptop work. Yeah. When it's docked. It's weird. I think I think you can do use power, although it charges through the dock, so I don't know why you would, but the like USB and gigabit Ethernet or audio don't work. It's like they turn off all of the I.O. on the laptop and put all of the bandwidth through that connector, which the dock has external connectors for USB and gigabit oh, I was gonna and audio ask. and stuff. Because it doesn't make much sense if you can't control it, right? Yeah. It goes really fast, but you can't use it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even put it in the commands to run a benchmark, but it's fast. <laughs> you have to be really quick. You put in the commands, hit start, and then dock it really fast. <laughs> There's actually a wee little printer on the very bottom of the dock that prints out what the frame rates you would be experiencing <laughs> would be. In dot matrix. Of yes. course. Yeah. Yeah, you feed uh, in a tape and oh, with ahead. instructions and then it spits out a tape with results. Yeah. Tell us about the aesthetics of the uh, of the box and the laptop itself. The aesthetics of the laptop are really nice. It's it's tapered. It's kind of your your matte black plastic finish. 
uh, you're dealing with the, the usual sort of chiclet style keyboard for the laptop. Um, the, the box, there's not much to say other than it looks like a big box. It looks like a can you, can mini you, can ITX you computer it with Texas case. Toast? Can, yeah. can you toast bread in it? Yeah. Yes. Maybe with the 290X, certainly. Yeah, probably. Yeah, get a, if you get a reference 290X, place your toast on a plate a little bit to the left of the box and wait about four minutes. See, now I'm interested. Yeah. Hot buttered toast. Uh, it certainly As looks like an interesting product, and, and it's one that we've been promised for a long, long time. How often have we heard about an external uh, box that'll support external GPUs? And it'll have some kind of you know PCIe or, or earlier you know an external AGP connection. Way, way, way back in the day, and it seems like we're finally, finally after 15 years getting getting these promises of of this product. But I, you know, what what did Brian think overall? Was was he impressed? Was was he not impressed? Or was it kind of a mediocre thing? Is it worth the price? Uh, certainly, the extra performance is is nice if if you're planning on gaming on your laptop and you want the right. full experience. But what what did he say about it in the end? He th- well, it's it's kind of a flawed product. It's a nice product, but then you have to wonder about. Uh, he called it like one and done, like worrying about that aspect of it. Is this going to be supported, this exact dock, this standard? If I buy this laptop now and then say I want to go to a, a future uh, Ultrabook that has a newer processor in it, but I still want to use my dock and I want to use my video card, will they keep supporting this standard? When you have this gaming dock at home, it's a, this is a $1,900 package for the two together, but do you have to rebuy this entire bundle later or will MSI keep making these game dock compatible computers? And it's just, it's a really cool concept because instead of it being a big hulking gaming laptop, you have more of an ultrabook style and then you can take it home and, and game on it as a desktop. So you, you make that one investment you've got a gaming machine a standalone video card that you buy and put in this box. But it's, I don't think it's really that expensive at 1900 considering you're getting a fully loaded Ultrabook with a really fast processor and the, the dock. I mean, it would obviously be nice to see it sell for less, but I think it's valid to kind of wonder, am I spending 1900 for this one thing and then wait and see if they're going to keep supporting it? And it is That's so a good out. question. I mean, HP and, and Dell have been supporting their, their dock stations for just years and years, and it doesn't matter what versions you get unless you get a really, really old one. Uh, it's, it's all the same slot and uh, physical implementation. So it's a, yeah. That's it's a, a good, good point. Like in the business MSI world, people are just used to these kind of desktop docks. You go into a workplace and you see a laptop that's just sitting in one of these docks. And their their keyboard, mouse, and monitor hooked up, and their you know IOs hooked up through that, and they take the laptop with them around the you know office or hospital or whatever it is. But it's a different concept, obviously, for a home user. It is. So thanks to Ryan for uh, writing that very very nice and lovely article. He's he's a poet. Doesn't know it. Uh, moving along, Gigabyte X99 SOC Champion Motherboard Review. This is the uh, great black and orange monstrosity that we heard quite a bit about at CES. And uh, Maury had the chance to take a look at it. So uh, the other person on the podcast who rarely talks, that would be Jeremy. He read this over. I, Let's I hear about it. never say a word, ever. Ever. This, the, like, this is a very impressive board for a bit of a niche market. Uh, if you're an enthusiast, for sure it is brilliant. If you're an extreme overclocker, on the other hand, this thing is perfect. Uh, it's been built right from the ground up to deal with LN2 cooling. It was the one that appeared uh, and holds the championship for max overclock uh, with Haswell E right now. And that is the Gigabyte X99 SoC Champion. It's like, more even refers to it as over engineered, and it bloody well is. It's got server level chokes on it, uh, 8 plus 4 power phase, 
And they've even gone so far as to move the dim slots just a wee bit closer to the socket to cut down on the length of those electrical runs. They, they've they gone nuts. They, the, even on the back, and some of the people in the comments uh, have mentioned, it's got PS2, PS2 parts. Why would that be? Well, because when you're an overclocker, you don't want to deal with a USB port that's a little bit off and it eats up CPU overhead. You want pure performance going to that overclocking score. Uh, as Ken showed just a second ago, it is one of the most ridiculously clean backplates that I have seen in a long time. There is nothing exposed there. Uh, it's perfect to just set up. Condensation is really not going to bug this thing. But, uh, I mean, from there, as far as actual usage for it goes, it's great. Uh, you've got one MD2 connector, uh, which can I believe it's 80 centimeters that it can fit up to, so it can fit some of the larger sized ones, or a SATA Express connector. You, they're exclusive. You get to pick one or the other, but at the same time, they're both there. Uh, it's got six SATA 6 gigabit with support for all the RAID you would want. If you're using one of the full 40 channel or PCIe, uh, yeah, 40 channel PCIe Express GPUs, you got two running at 16, two running at 8. If you go for the lesser one, it is limited a little bit more, but if you're going this nuts on a motherboard, why would you bother going with a lower end Haswell E? It comes with a ridiculous amount of applications, most of which I haven't heard of, uh, but essentially it's got like a little app center, with, so you've got Easy Tune, but you've also got Easy Setup and everything wrapped in. Mori digs right into the UEFI BIOS where it ranges from, would you like to run this on quiet and low power, because you know we all love to underclock our processors, to the extreme models, and there is even uh, an, an OC button that is not th the OC that you're used to. This is the one that gets rid of the cold bug and fully expects that, yes, you've got a giant homemade heat sink full of LN2 sitting on top of it. Once you got into the benchmarks, uh, as you'd expect, I mean, no matter what you do to an X99, it's it's not going to be that much better until he hit the memory benchmark. When he started doing the memory benchmark, and this was, of course, with the custom-made, well, custom-made, uh, the Corsair DIMMs that were paired with this motherboard specifically for the overclocking competition, he actually saw slightly better performance. Now, when you're gaming, you may not see memory bandwidth actually having a huge impact on your frame rate, but the fact that Gigabyte actually went so far out as to design something a little bit off spec that is grabbing almost 10% better uh, in memory bandwidth than any of the com competition is kind of impressive to me. And I mean, Josh, you remember the old motherboard days where the chipset meant so much. Like, there was so much on the motherboard that it really mattered which one you got. Correct. Nowadays, you've got to work really hard to make a product that actually stands out as far as a motherboard goes. And Gigabyte, you know, really has done that. Because when it all comes down to it, it's the CMOS battery placement. And in this review, Mori gave it a positive rating. It's <laughs> nestled right in between the second and third PCIe slot and is, in almost every circumstance, completely and totally accessible. And when you're overclocking to an extreme extent, that might actually be something that's rather useful. So, of course, this came away with a gold award. Uh, it's an incredible board, and some of you might be cringing, you know, just how much is this going to run? Well, it's selling on Amazon for just under $300, and Newegg had it on for about $280 not too long ago, which, when you're going for flagship X99 motherboards, almost qualifies as cheap. Not Almost. cheap for motherboards, but... So, uh, this thing, if if all you've got is a single GPU, you've got one uh, CPU that you're not really thinking about overclocking that much, you don't have an M.2 or an SXE or a SATA Express port uh, drive, you know, this might not be the perfect choice for you, but for just about anyone else that's serious about overclocking is looking for a board that will either take abuse and just keep running or will take straight out torture with LN2. This is a purpose-built board exactly for you and is definitely something worth checking out. 
Outstanding work, Maury and Jeremy, for reading that. Uh, certainly, it's it's nice to see some differentiation in the motherboard market, and especially that it is cheaper than a lot of other X99 motherboards. I, I mean, you look at that Asus X99 Pro, that white one. It's like a $350 product. Some of the top-end ones, over 400 bucks. So something sub-300 in this market that does some of the things that it does is kind of nice. But enough about that. You know, I haven't heard from Sebastian enough. Seems like there's a uh, Silverstone case that uh, he reviewed. I, I don't know where he gets his time, but he gets it from somewhere. I just neglect all of my personal responsibilities and my wife. A wise choice. Yes. But hey, you so, got some I mean, great it's, for, it's for the good of the site. So, you know, you can do it. So, this is the Kubla, I think. Kublai. The KL's Kublai? Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan. Kublai. Buddy hell. It's the KL05-W. You can call it Temuji, but dash nobody w. will get that. I did. Okay. The Carry on, that. Sebastian. It, if you're looking at the picture here, if you're watching at home, this is a really kind of a retro-looking case. It's boxy. It's not real stylish. They do have a nice little blue fan on the front that comes with it, 120 millimeter fan. But this is this is not going to wow you with its style. This is an affordable case. It's a pretty big case too. It's still mid tower, but it's kind of it's almost like a small full tower. It's got eight expansion slots and it's pretty tall. But this is about a $69 full retail price. And the big, the big story with this to me was cooling support. It has three pairs of, uh, like in the front, it's got a pair of 120 slash, you know, 140 millimeter fans you can put in there or, ra- uh, or a 240 or 280 radiator. You can do the same thing on the bottom, although I think that one's limited to two 120 millimeter fans. And then on the top, you've got another 120 slash 140 support. And right below that picture we're looking at, um, maybe I'm a little off here. On the first page, you can see how Silverstone on their website shows you installing a radiator above the case, but below this compartment. Like the top of the case actually hides an area to either put extra fans if you're doing push-pull above the motherboard and need a little extra room, or if you want to mount the entire radiator up above the case to keep your motherboard completely clear. Um, it gives you a lot of flexibility with the extra height. And it one of the things I liked about the design here is that they actually made really good use of the extra space inside the case. So, yeah, they gave you extra height, but they also gave you optical drive bays. So you've got a pair of the five and a quarter inch bays if you're still using optical drives. You have a total of eight toolless hard drive bays. I took four of them out. They're two um, removable uh, cages that have four hard drives supported in each. If you have a longer video card, you can pull the top cage out. They just come out with thumb screws from the back. It's very simple. Undo the thumb screws, slide the whole thing out. The hard drive uh, them, the hard drives themselves mount to toolless frames. You just kind of pop them in and slide them in place. You don't need any screws. So it, two and using, a half inch support. What's that? Two and a half inch drive support. Yeah, there's two 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 and a half inch drive bays back behind the motherboard. Those are also little don't metal trays that come out, but those removable three and a, a half inch bays all support SSDs as well. You would have to screw those in, but there are mounting points on all eight of the plastic oh, trays for SSDs. So you could have 10 SSDs in here. You could put in eight hard drives and two SSDs. You have a lot of storage flexibility. Alan's ear is just perked up. Yeah, it's it, For a $69 case to give you the flexibility of, of installing up to three 240-millimeter or 280-millimeter rads, and again, I think it's only 240 on the bottom, but still, and another 120 on the back. Uh, when I installed my what's kind of become my de facto test system recently, which is a, an AMD-based system with an 8350 FX CPU and my R9290X card. I just used my uh, Cooler Master H75 cooler on the back with on the 120 fan mount. And I left the front 
intake fan in, in place just to see kind of how out of the box it performed with cooling. But there's a there's so much flexibility with this thing and a lot of room for much bigger PSUs than I used. I have a fairly small PSU at 160 millimeters. This thing will take like up to 220, I think. So whatever components you have laying around, whatever kind of cooling you want to do, there was room for it in here. And it performed pretty well. It was easily one of the quietest cases I've tested with this particular set of components anyway. It was about as quiet as the uh, Define R5 from Fractal Design. Now, admittedly with, with different components, so I'm not sure head-to-head how they stack up, but the front intake fan was very quiet, and this is a, a, a thick enough case that even without insulation, the plastic and metal kind of dampen the sound quite a bit. And cooling wasn't bad at all. I mean, the front intake fan help there wasn't the best. The uh, last week's uh, NZXT S340 case, the other $69 case I just did, that one outperformed it a little bit in cooling. But this one was excellent and just provides you a ton of room. Very nice. So essentially, in Xanadu, did Kublai Khan a pleasure dome erect? Hmm. Gosh, I remember the rest of that one, Josh. D- damn knuckle draggers. I just heard several words in the same two sentences that are very disturbing it's to me. It's a poem, damn it. <laughs> yes, you're all heathens. This is the state of our liberal education in the United States today. Only this Jeremy. is a guy from Wyoming talking. Damn you. Damn you all. You blew it all up. No, we just know how to spell Kubla, and that doesn't have an I. <sighs> anyway. No. You know, getting away from Sebastian, because as much as I like staring at his Conan O'Brien face, <sighs> we got to move along. So, uh, you know, something kind of funny happened a few months back. People with 840 Evos had some issues with slowdown. There was a fix involved, and then some months later, these people who applied the fix had some issues. And I'm just not talking about a rash, though some people might be, but not in this case. Uh, Alan, can you take on from here before I dig a bigger hole? Yeah, so um, 840 Evos were reading files that had been sitting on the drives for a long time uh, slower than they should have. And if you gave them long enough, the speeds would slow all the way down to like um, you know, like 100 meg per second, where it should be going around 500 meg per second. Uh, and that's pretty significant. Um, and as a matter of fact, there's an example right there Ken's uh, showing. That's uh, one of the samples we were testing. Uh, could, you f- could you find the place where I wrote a file in the middle there? <laughs> so that's like a freshly written file in the middle of that. 250 meg per second read chunk there. And actually, uh, there's another sample. Uh, the better example is on the third page of the article. And um, that's where I had a different sample just kind of sitting for even a few more months after uh, testing that one that's uh, on the picture on the front page. And uh, that one had slowed all the way down to about 100 meg per second. And it, it took a little longer. Don't get me wrong. Uh, the original. That same drive originally only took like three months to slow down to that speed the first time around. Then I did that performance restoration tool, and there was a different firmware that did some tweaking to the SSD. Uh, but like six months later, here we were again, right? So it took about twice as long to slow down. Uh, but guess what? There was another fix that Samsung had been working on for quite some time, partially because uh, of a sample that I sent them. Like I sent them some data a couple months ago, and they said, hey, uh, we'd really like it if you could send us that drive. So I sent that off to them. They looked at it, looked at some other samples they had, I would imagine. Um, I would hope their fix didn't just hinge on my one sample. And uh, they came out with a patch. And initially, uh, we did a news piece, I think it was about a month back, uh, where they issued a statement, and the statement made it sound like they were the only... The only way they could fix this was just with some new version of SSD Magician that was just going to periodically refresh data on the drive, which to me seemed like just a Band-Aid fix and wasn't really a fix in my opinion. And then they ended up doing something completely different. So they gave me a firmware and a new version of Magician. 
And without using the new version of Magician at all, uh, I applied the firmware. And just by applying the firmware and then unplugging the drive, booting all the way into Windows, and basically plugging the drive in, and as soon as it was recognized by Windows, I didn't give it any chance to do anything, basically. Um, and I immediately ran an HDTAC read pass again on it. And the drive would have taken a good 10 or 15 minutes to be able to, um, you know, if it had rewritten that data, um, to do that. So it obviously didn't have that much time. And that, and those speeds jumped right up to around 400 meg per second for data that had been sitting on the drive for like six months. Uh, and not only that, but that data was an IOMeter test file, which had like random writes performed to it. So actually that read speed would be expected even if it was like a fresh file in that case, because it, it was a fragmented f file. So you're reading it sequentially, but the SSD itself is actually reading at random. Um, so that's good, right? That's basically the drive just snapped right back to what it should be doing. Um, as if the sold on issue wasn't even an issue and all I did was just patch a firmware. So what has to be happening here is it's able to adjust on the fly for cell drift. Cell voltage drift is what happens just over time on any SSD. Um, but TLC SSDs are more sensitive to it because you only have to drift half as far uh, to you know, get into a point where the SSD would have to do like error correction and things like that. But if you can just recognize that, hey, all of these cells seem to be a little bit lower than they should be, uh, you can do the, this kind of like a threshold adjustment where if, you know, this voltage equates to this logic state, you know, you can actually shift those around if the controller is intelligent enough and Samsung controller is new enough to be, to be able to do that. Um, it just is a matter of the firmware correctly doing it, which it appears to be correctly doing now. Then on top of that, even though the speeds are back to where they should be just from the firmware alone, um, they also told us about a, a procedure that can be done, it can be triggered by the firmware itself to perform another operation, which basically causes the controller in the background, like Windows doesn't even, Windows doesn't even see the drive as active, uh, and it actually doesn't even really seem to slow performance or anything like that either. It just, as soon as it sees uh, like idle time, it does this function in the background once it's been triggered. And what that does is it goes through any old data, I think it's actually just any data that's written to the SSD, and it just rewrites it. Now, this, this procedure does burn through like one to two erase cycles of the data. I think it would just use neatly one cycle because I believe it just plays musical chairs with all of the flash memory on the block level and just like rewrites everything sequentially. Um, and when you do that, uh, it actually causes the SSD to go even faster than say any other SSD that wasn't performing this kind of, this kind of an operation. Um, so for example, if you had a windows install and you'd been oper running on it for like six months to a year, and even, even if it was an MLC SSD, uh, and didn't have any kind of slowdown over time issues, the, the drive would be going a little bit slower over time just because files get fragmented. Um, the flash itself gets fragmented as little pieces of files get rewritten and the, the SSD has to do, you know, background manipulation of that data. And if you were to take that OS that you had installed for like a year and say clone it off of the SSD to another drive and then put it all back, you would actually see a performance increase. It wouldn't be huge, but it would still be a performance increase you would see because none of those files are fragmented anymore. They're all, they have all been sequentially written like neatly to the SSD. That advanced optimization function actually does that for you, and it can do it while the OS is running within Windows on that same SSD. Um, so what initially we thought was going to be a Band-Aid fix actually makes this even better than like, you know, a, put, the, put aside the fact that there was a slowdown issue. If you take it in its current state for the patched Evos now, um, you have a button you could push in Magician to trigger this advanced optimization and it will make the SSD basically fresh. Like even as if you just like cloned your OS to something else and put it back, making it even faster. Um, so that's kind of another bonus, right? And uh, actually, if you scroll down a little bit, Ken, uh, there's even a better example in Iometer. 
I actually did a read only iometer uh, pass on one sample, on a one terabyte sample, in uh, all of those conditions, right? So the white line there is before the update on a slowed, you know, a drive that just had stale data. And that, that, that's IOPS performance right there. So that's what people would actually feel. Like, actually, Josh is a perfect example, right? He, he said his, uh, his Evo feels like it's going slower, right, Josh? Sure. Well, there I you go. I say that like, about myself and my wife anyway, so don't take well, that as gospel. So that white line right there versus the um, kind of yellowish green line and the red line, those two are basically the same uh, you know, between the both of them. But that's just the patched version of the drive. Right, just one test was immediately after a reboot, and then the second test was I gave it ten minutes just to see if uh, maybe it was doing something in the background, but didn't really seem to be. Um, then I triggered that performance restoration, that optim, that advanced optimization, and then you get the purple line, and the purple line is what kind of result I would see if I had just put a fresh iometer test file on that drive that had not been previously fragmented. Um, so it's actually even better. And just the fact that you can do it very easily is kind of inadvertently a bonus to 840 Evos now. It's kind of, it's kind of funny. Like, I, I wish they would provide that feature on, like, all of their SSDs because you could basically do the equivalent of a background defrag pass of the flash by hitting that button. So cool. let me ask one question. Yeah. What would this do for the amount of rights potentially that the NAND can handle. Will this decrease longevity or will it be about the same? So if you do the performance optimization uh, yourself, every time you hit that button and an SSD performs that procedure, which takes, uh, takes a certain amount of time just based on how much data is on the SSD, basically. It's uh, roughly proportional. Um, so I would say you know it could take like anywhere from five minutes to probably like an hour or two if it was like a one terabyte um, model and it was full. Uh, but that operation will eat like one cycle. Okay. Um, the rough estimate of like the rating for the TLC flash is around a thousand cycles. So you have used 0.1% of the lifespan of your SSD by hitting the button every time you do it. Right. Um, as far as uh, what Samsung said, as far as like that, the firmware can automatically do this same procedure if it needs to. Um, it didn't seem to do it automatically on a drive that I had patched that was in a state that it was very slow already, right? So just the firmware itself had, just by the read algorithm being changed, made it so it was able to read at basically the speed it should have been reading the entire time. And just by me tinkering around with it and trying to read what was previously slow data, it wasn't slow enough to, tr to seem to trigger that, that thing to happen automatically. Right? So maybe it would, have, it would have taken even another few more months to get to a point where it would trigger that operation. Um, so from, from what I can tell, if you patch the drive, uh, just based on what my samples did, uh, patching it puts it back where it should be, and you're not really going to do any additional wear unless you go and you hit that performance optimization button yourself. And then even if you do, it's 0.1% of the lifespan. So when are you going to be brave enough to do it to rated drives? Uh, so, okay, so here's something that was interesting. I was running the motherboard in RAID mode in the BIOS but when I went to do this patch. And not even thinking, I was just still in RAID mode. I, like, forgot. Uh, and uh, the firmware updater saw the Evo and did the firmware update just fine. So it was able to punch right through that. So it didn't um, even care it was an HCI? It just it, it, it didn't care. Now, I had the drive connected individually, and it was not part of a RAID. And that might cause them to be enumerated differently, right? If you, if you actually had a RAID of a pair of 840 Evos, and the BIOS recognized it as a RAID then the updater might not work in that case. Um, but the way to do it in that case is first, make sure you back up all your data because you're about to break, yeah. kind of break a RAID or make the RAID disappear, patch your drives and put the RAID back. But um, 
you basically just go in your BIOS, you switch out of RAID mode, and then you boot into that uh, firmware updater, boot off of the ISO, or you can burn the ISO to a USB drive uh, if you use like Rufus or, or whatnot. It worked just fine for me. Um, and then once, the, it's, once your BIOS is set up to see the drives individually, uh, then you could patch both of them, or however many you have. And then you just reboot again, go back in your BIOS, put them back in RAID mode, or pre, uh, BIOS back in RAID mode, and provided that the firmware update itself went smoothly and you know, nothing happened with either one of the drives you patched, It'll just pick it right back up, and it'll, you know, show back up as if uh, nothing happened. Nice. Well, I'm glad yeah. that they're finally kind of fixing this product. It's uh, it's been a long time. It's it was a popular thing for quite some time. Uh, certainly, now that the 85850 Evo is out, uh, it's been kind of overshadowed. Uh, OCZ's got the Vertex 460 and those series, so uh, it's nice that Samsung is showing those poor people like myself who had one of the Evo drives. A little love for a change. Yeah. We all need a little love. <laughs> Speaking of more love, I'm looking at you, Alan. Because Aww. you've got something else to talk about here. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, I think it was a week ago. I Let me apply some doc. Icy Doc to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Flying directly to the forehead? <laughs> <laughs> if that's where it hurts. A <laughs> couple of weeks ago, I looked at a couple of Icy Doc products, and uh, then I looked at a couple more. So, uh, this time I went for a um, uh, simple two bay, three and a half inch uh, hard drive RAID. In a box, um, which is the uh, what was that one called? Let's see here, uh, IC one. Raid. So there's an IC Raid, which is a two bay, and then an IC Cube, which is a four bay. And you would think that they're just progressing from one to the next, but they're actually very different from each other. Um, the IC Raid, the two bay, is just a, like a very simple um, raid on a chip like the most generic kind of uh, RAID controller you can imagine. Like there's no, there's no initialization, there's no, um, you know, none of that happens with this kind of RAID controller. There is a physical switch on the back. It's in JBOD, big drive, which just appends one drive to the other. Uh, RAID 0, which just stripes for speed, and then RAID 1, which just mirrors. And you, you basically, you put your drives in, they have to be, well... In just a bunch of drives mode, you can just put drives in, and it'll just they'll just show up as two individual drives. So that's safe. But any other condition, do not put drives that have data in them in this thing, right? It, it, basically, it's counting on the drives being empty, and then if you want to run it in a RAID mode, you put your empty drives in. Uh, you hit the reset button underneath that switch after you've put the switch in the position you want, and then it just shows up in Windows as, you know, whatever capacity would correspond to the RAID mode that you chose. Um, and that's it. Like, that, that's as, as far as RAID configuration, it doesn't get much simpler than that. Um, it, it's like a really basic hardware RAID. Uh, and the performance was pretty decent. Um, let's see. I did uh, test. I had 6-terabyte uh, reds, which, by the way, 6-terabyte drives were seen. They worked just fine. Um, it actually gives you like a 12 terabyte disk if you put it in RAID 0. It's uh, kind of unsettling, the level of Death Wish RAID that you're, you're playing with there. But if you really want it, you can do it. Um, but I was able to get full speed, no issue. Um, uh, let's see, I did big disk mode, and then I did uh, RAID 0, and that roughly doubled the speeds um, of the reds. And then I think, uh, let's see, where did I go? I went down... I went all the way down to the bottom there. That last Addo run uh, was I snuck an 850 Pro in there. And it didn't seem to max out. It almost acted as if uh, it was going SATA 2. But I'm not sure what the deal was there. But I will say that there aren't any hard drives that really push past even SATA 2. So for whatever reason, maybe this RAID chip just is a little finicky on what it negotiates. It really... Doesn't matter. It's able to go faster than that on the on the USB three side, and any three and a half inch regular hard drive you go on there, it's it's going to be able to go at least um, those speeds that you're going to get out of those. So as far as that goes, you know, it's pretty okay. 
Um, now, moving on to the Icy Cube, that is a completely different beast. It is basically a just a bunch of drives only enclosure. Um, so you put four drives in there, they will show up individually. If you want them to be in a RAID, you have to set up the RAID yourself on the operating system side, just you know, for the operating system that just sees four drives, right? Um, there is, uh, for connectivity on this guy, you have USB 3 and eSATA. And a trick with Windows is if you want to use like the old school kind of Windows RAID, you know, the dynamic disk RAID, uh, that doesn't work with USB. It, like it just doesn't give you that option. So you would have to hook it up eSATA if you wanted to do that. Um, if you're using Windows Storage Spaces and Windows 8, you're safe. That'll work on pretty much anything. If you want to use, if you want your RAID to be configured that way, that's okay. Um, or if you just have, you know, four hard drives sitting that used to be in individual enclosures that you just want to all be connected to the system in one neat single housing, right? This is the thing for you to use. Um, speeds were uh, pretty decent. Um, this actually saw much uh, faster speed if you, if you go all the way to the bottom with the 850 Pro plugged into it. It basically went almost full speed for that drive. Um, but it did not appear to be, uh, it doesn't show up as a UASP device. So the two bay raid that I, that we just talked about was UASP and could handle command queuing. This one does not. So it's kind of like, you know, the, the features are just kind of toggle back and forth between these two devices. Um, as opposed to just being like a logical pro progression, basically be able to say it's the same thing, but it has two more bays. It's totally not. It's like two different animals. Um, and then finally, uh, for the pricing, uh, it's like 115 bucks for the two bay and 192 for the four bay. Seems kind of high for the four bay model, especially since it doesn't do any raid uh, built-in functions. You just have simple JBOD. Um, but the build quality is pretty decent of both of them. You know, it's like nice extruded aluminum housing looks like you can drop it from a fairly decent height without really uh you know messing anything up in there except for if the hard drives are spinning then it's not really going to protect them from from a fall necessarily but so i gave yeah, the, I, I swing I around my four bay over my head quite often when they're running yeah yeah well, Let i me wouldn't see that four bay and uh you know have you do some rights on it yeah while swinging it. Yeah. Anyway, that's interesting anyway. stuff, Alan. You know, we've got one more uh, major review. And I say major with quotation marks, but I'm, I'm too lazy to put my fingers up there. But Sebastian has yet again outshone us all on this entire podcast. So tell us, tell us about the Motorola Moto E 215 with Lollipop. It's the... So it's the 2015 version of the Moto E. This is a phone that Motorola came out with uh, late last year. Uh, the, the new Moto E, and I'm actually holding it along with uh, several other phones I have here. Um, the Moto E is a 4.5-inch phone. This is a budget phone. This is a un I had the unlocked version. It's a GSM phone you can use anywhere in the world. Um, I used it on AT&T and T-Mobile's networks here when I was testing it. This phone is LTE capable. It's running a Snapdragon 410 SoC, which has an LTE baseband baked into it. So anybody who incorporates the 410 automatically gets LTE capability, basically. So when they adopted this new SoC, they were able to take what was last year a low-end dual-core phone, and they basically just gave it the new SoC. It's using the same... Resolution screen is last year. This is a low res 540 by 960 screen. So this is not a high resolution screen at all. It's it's basically a quarter of the total number of pixels as a 1080p screen. So you're you're dealing with half of the usable space. Uh, scaling on the on the home screen and using the operating system feels about the same as it would on a 1080p device, like my Moto X that I was comparing it against in this review. Everything just looks a little bit softer on the display. But Josh will appreciate, and Alan, 
it's an IPS screen. So it, they didn't skimp on the quality of the panel too much. It's just a low res panel. Um, and, and there's some other things about it too. Like the design is really nice, but it's really thick. So if you were to look at this thing in comparison with any other, you know, flagship type phone, and if you're in an operator store, you're going to notice that the thing is about a half inch thick. Holy in the crap. Mm. Well, how else That's, are you going to use it as a hammer? Yeah, it, it, it is it a feels, Motorola after it, all. It feels really hefty. Like in one of the, I kind of wondered about that, taking it out of the box, because it had a decent weight to it. And I knew this was an all-plastic phone. But they put a pretty big battery in this thing. For a, a phone this size, it has a 2,390 milliamp hour battery, which is 90 milliamp hours bigger than the one in the Moto X that you see right next to it in that picture. So battery life on this thing was great. Um, with the screen brightness cranked up to as close to 180 lux as I could approximate, uh, I got 7.6 hours of battery life in our PC per battery test, which was an hour more than my Nexus 6 or the Moto X. And a lot of that's the, the lower power processor. I mean, you're dealing with something that's almost exactly one half the speed. It's 1.2 gigahertz quad core versus, you know, 2.4 and 2.7 and, and these other phones. But the practical aspect like of the performance that browsing, scrolling, you know, opening up apps, the overall performance of the phone was fine. It, it's if you're really sensitive to the resolution, everything on the phone is going to look a little soft to you. If you've used other budget phones, the prepaid market is full of of phones with this screen resolution. This is like a commodity screen resolution for a four ish inch smartphone at this point. Um, the really inexpensive uh, Nokia Lumia phones, like the Lumia four thirty five. I believe uses the same screen resolution. I want to say, and this is a world of like fifty to a hundred dollar phones that somebody can bring to a carrier or buy a prepaid SIM card for. And a a big advantage I think here that Motorola has, dating back to when Google owned them, and they've since sold off the mobility division to Lenovo, but they. They had stock Android running on these things. And the Moto X, the current version of that, the 2014 version, the Nexus 6, this second-gen uh, Moto E, the 2015 version, they're all running stock Lollipop. And I'm running version uh, 5.0.2 out of the box, which is actually newer than the Moto X, which is still on 5.0. And OTA updates do come down for these Motorola phones very quickly. In fact, I've been getting them sooner than my AT&T Nexus 6. So it, there's an advantage to buying an unlocked device, and Google's been very aggressive about pushing out software updates. I had, I've been using Mo Lollipop on all of these phones. Uh, basically, whatever version is current for them, I've had them since day one or at least week one. And... The, 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 basically everything is kind of stacked in favor of a device like this if you can live with a lower resolution screen very good battery life then you, you have the drawbacks this is not a flagship phone and I don't even consider the camera in the Moto X which is a $500 unlocked device to be very good it, it makes up for the limitations of, this, of the sensor by having a permanent gain turned on you get kind of blown out whites and really grainy looking pictures with the Moto X then in the in the Nexus 6 which is a $650 device you get closer to the quality of maybe a Samsung or an Apple phone it's a Sony sensor and it has optical image stabilization which allows it to use you know lower ISO speeds longer exposure times the pictures look much better on the Nexus 6 you go down to the Moto E and pictures are just terrible I only did one quick little photo shoot for the review and it was enough to demonstrate that if I went, it was broad daylight, a uh, picture of the headphones wearing in front of some of my big box games I've got here. And the picture with the Moto E as we slide over and look here, it looks like it was taken at dusk 
and they were taken like a minute apart. I set the the phones in exactly the same place and snapped the shots at the default settings with the Google camera. And it just does not handle light well. Colors are not accurate. Everything looks really dingy. So it's it's just kind of checking a feature box there. Yes, it has the camera. Yes, it's five megapixels. It has autofocus. It also has the, no depth of field. No. no, no. Zero. <laughs> it's it's as pretty much as bad as it can be. Uh, but it's it's there at least. I mean, you you can say, well, I could take a picture if I had to to record, you know, something. But it's it's even outdoors in broad daylight, you're not going to get very good pictures with this phone. So, you know, it's you have to have a camera really to have a single device that you carry around with you these days. You absolutely, obviously, have to have it uh, reliably connected to the network and, and handle phone calls well too. And that was kind of one of the other disappointing parts of this phone. Just making phone calls with it was not great. It was okay. But the microphone, it's very odd how they they placed it. It's on the bottom of the phone, but it's facing the same direction as the rear-facing camera. It's facing away from you when you're talking on the phone. It's very hard to see. But either you're kind of cupping it with your hand when you're talking on the phone, or you're not cupping it, and then as you walk... Wind noise is hitting it from the outside constantly. And the only microphone that it can use for noise cancellation is up by the camera. And so it's a little wonky. It, it, the noise cancellation doesn't work that well. And if you kind of cup the phone like I did when I was walking outside, making a couple of test phone calls, then you sound really, really tinny. Or, or you sound like you're talking into like a coffee mug. It sounds really bad. So... Call quality indoors was okay, but outdoors wasn't so great. So there's huge drawbacks, but we're, again, we're talking about a phone that's full, unlocked price for a, a smartphone with a, you know, a Snapdragon 410 quad-core processor and LTE data capability and stock Android Lollipop. It's 149 bucks, And a couple of carriers uh, have been offering it for less. I was going to link to Verizon selling it for $99 in the review, and when I actually created the link, it was only selling for sixty nine. So they're they're pushing this phone out there as an affordable option for someone who doesn't want to be locked into a contract. Bring your own device um, situation, but it, you you definitely have some trade offs, and it has the lower end specs, like only one gigabyte of memory, only eight gigs of onboard storage, but. You can expand on the storage with a micro SD like I did for the review. I put a 16 gig Samsung Evo card in there, and that worked well. I was able to install applications to it, and all my photos and everything were on that card. But overall, it it kind of is a very good example of where phones are going. Like we're going to have more and more of these sub $200 smartphones on the market this year. Uh, I believe it was LG that announced some of their phones at CES were going to be coming out even with in-cell touch for the digitizer on their budget and mid-range phones. So that'll be much closer to the high-quality screen that you see on iPhones and on the screen that will be on the uh, G4 because they're finally getting away from that digitizer layer that can make things look a little kind of milky and make the screen harder to see out in sunlight. So there's, there's good stuff coming for affordable phones this year, and I thought this was kind of like the harbinger of that. Not necessarily this is the device that you will run out and get, and this is everything you'll ever need, but it's a very good smartphone if you've got about 100 bucks, and if you're like me and you really appreciate stock Android and want to be on the latest version of Android just just to, to have it and to test it out, it's be a great like developer device on the cheap, and the performance is actually pretty good. I threw in a few benchmarks in the review to give you an idea of how it how it performed. And it was it was decent. It's clearly the low end phone of the three that I tested, but it is certainly nothing to be ashamed of. And if it weren't for the thickness, the style of the phone isn't bad at all. So well, that's nice nice to hear. You know, certainly this is some area that <clears throat> guys like Intel have really been pushing into the more affordable smartphones for not just the U.S. market, but you know, for, for places that cannot afford a $600 flagship-type product or even last year's 
flagship. So it's uh, it's nice to see these kind of products coming out uh, closer to home. That's our reviews for the week. We got a couple of pieces of news. I think Jeremy's going to handle this, but uh, NVIDIA and AMD have released some new drivers because of one rather large game. And when I say large, I'm not kidding. Game? I, I thought this was part of the U.S. tax thing, this GTAV thing that everyone's talking about. It could be. It's a game? And it's taxed directly to the U.S. government. So oh, well, making, okay. So it, it still involves tax. But uh, sure. I mean, not a surprise for NVIDIA. Uh, the game-ready driver is something that they've been doing for a little while now. So every time you see a major release, you see NVIDIA putting out a new driver. Generally, it's small in the improvements, except specifically at one particular application. On the other hand, AMD putting out the 15.4 beta, well... I, as far as I can remember, we haven't seen anything since the Omega. So this is more or less the first advertised driver they've put out. There's been a few betas, and this is, again, a beta, but it's it's one that they're actually sort of pushing and saying, hey, if if you went out and downloaded this tax form and you want it to look the best it possibly can, <laughs> then you know just install this driver and you may even get a tax credit on it. So, really, I mean, if, if this is what you've got to deal with, if, if this is what you do, if this is what you find amusing is filling out GTA V, doesn't matter which card you're using, go down, grab the driver, and you might not have to pay as many much taxes. Plus, the text looks really smooth with that new driver, too. It was anti-aliased oh, yeah. really well. You don't want to be squinting and trying to figure out if that's a 9 or an 8. That's, no. That, that could no. cost you pennies. Yeah, it's the IRS experience software that they integrated into that program. Uh, you know, Inwin, talking about cases, it's an affordable 503 enclosure. What do you know about Inwin, Sebastian? Well, the, usually they sell cases that are aluminum and aluminum and glass, and they're really expensive and beautiful. But this thing is going to be targeting $50, so forty nine ninety nine MSRP, and it's it still has tempered glass on it. So in when true to their design aesthetic there, it's got a slide down front glass panel that hides their lone optical bay. And even at forty nine bucks, this thing has a, a side window and it comes with a rear case fan, I believe. And it they have a little product video I put in the news post to kind of show it off. But it it's a really stylish looking case. And I was very surprised when I kind of delved into it a little bit more and saw that they were planning a $49 MSRP for it. It's not a lot of scratch. No. No, it's got, uh, you know, some decent uh, front panel connections and everything in there that you possibly need and some decent space and aesthetics. PSU at the bottom? Don't yep. forget aesthetics. Very important for a computer yes. case. And yes. toolless bays. I forgot about that. Completely toolless. Plenty of room for a big GPU. It looks very impressive for the price. And an optical drive bay. It's getting more rare. I know you, you had, would appreciate that. Yeah, we had that discussion last week. Uh, finally, last piece of news. Until Skylake slides have been leaked... So this is going to be a consumer socketed version, socket 1151. Uh, there's some interesting things that came out about this. Namely, it will go in TDPs from 35 to 65 watts for most applications, but most interestingly, they will have a 95-watt enthusiast quad core, and we're assuming, of course, that'll be hyper-threaded, so it'll be an eight-thread part that will be faster than usual. That's something we haven't seen for a while. I think, what, the highest end right now is 87 watts? Sounds about right. Yeah. And so uh, it's going to be a nice little change of pace that we get a little higher TDPs, hopefully a little higher performance. It'll tell us a little bit more about Intel's 14 nanometer Trigate process and see potentially what it can do. It's going to be uh, it's still going to be a 1 by 16 PCIe 3 uh, supporting slot in the enthusiast kind of grade. You can put that in 2x8, 4x4, however much they want to do to to uh, you know partition and cut up those uh, 
those lanes. But they're going to have the, uh, what, H100 series of chipsets? Am I doing that Brought right? Brought to you by Corsair. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, no, they, like literally the branding is going the, the Z170, the H170, and the H110. Brought to you by Corsair. Yeah. <laughs> So it'll be a next generation I/O. Uh, it, it, it looks Direct interesting. Direct memory in that interface 3.0. What's that? Direct memory interface 3.0. Yeah, it's going to have a better DMI connection to the processor, so we're going to have a little bit better bandwidth than we have what we have seen in the past, which is a positive, positive thing. But um, what it ops it offers six SATA six drives, which is kind of interesting, but. I'm sure there are going to be other things that uh, there's also will a cool offset. thing listed. What's uh, that? Intel RST for PCIe storage. Yeah, that's yeah. A, that sounds cool. At least I don't know. yeah, yeah. So this is going to be the next generation stuff. We haven't heard a whole lot, obviously, about it. This is uh, what two or three slides that were leaked. You'll need to take a look over what Ryan has written and uh, you know see what uh, the next generation of Intel parts are coming our way. And before we go into our hardware software picks of the week, Ken, do you know about this? The uh, Asus um, thing? I don't know what you're talking about. Can you mention this at the start of the picks of the weeks? Asus, the 500 ROG million. Thing. Five rigs, five winners, 500 million motherboards sold. NCIX Rogue Type S case. That will be fitted with a Z97 Mark S motherboard, Core i7, 4790, 16 gigs of memory, uh, GTX 980, Seagate uh, SSHD 1 terabyte, Intel 730 SSD. Boy, all ah. kinds of stuff in there. Do you see that now? I do. No, it's not resolving for me for some reason. <laughs> well, that's because you're in Canada. Well, oh, actually, it should, it should resolve see. for you, but essentially, it uh, looks to be it looks to be a giveaway. You give the nice ASUS North America people your name, ab, email address, date of birth. What does five hundred million mean to you? For Jeremy, I'm afraid to ask because that's a lot of lice, but that's nothing. That's my study work units, I think. Yeah, but. Uh, the people are putting some advertising on our site about this particular thing, and you need to check it out and say, hey, PC Per sent me, because that's what they do. Good stuff. That looks like a pretty solid machine. NCIX. Get it? Um, uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the case manufacturer? It's not NCIX. That's NZXT. The, the, NZXT. This is too confusing to me. My my premature dementia brain just can't keep on to all these four letter things that start with N. Anyway, software hardware picks of the week. As you notice, Ryan's not here. It's because he's playing golf. He is the one percent. He's the upper crust. And you can tell his, by the way uh, he was complaining about how good his golf game was and how he wished he played worse. Yeah, because it's all going to be going down here from here through the fall. It sucks to be him. Jeremy, what is your pick, or rather the anti-pick? Oh, it, We don't pull out the anti-picks very often, but after last week and shouting out to good old games about bringing back all the games which aren't supported anymore, I really have to give the middle finger to <laughs> these <laughs> bastards over at uh, the Entertainment Software Association who are now trying to do takedown notices for anybody who supports games which have been abandoned by the publisher. And so by abandoned, we don't mean, well, it's just a couple of years out of date and they're not putting patches out. No, we're talking about statute of limitations is expired, your, your patent, unless you're Disney, is probably freaking expired, and you've got a community that loves the game so much they're trying to bring it back, and they're sending takedown notices against them. It actually goes further, because if you ever wanted to set up a computer game museum, or you wanted to you run some you know weird site no one's ever thought of like the Internet Archives and archive some of these games to be playable online. Well, guess what? They're going to be sending you a takedown notice because how dare you try and bring back a piece of your childhood? 
like the, the, it's ridiculous. You're not making money off of it anymore. You, you technically don't even really have copyright on this anymore, and you're now sending bully boys after the people that love you and love your games to take down what you have done. This is ridiculous, guys. Give it up. You're, you're actually now spending money on something you're not making but the money on. But they're stealing our pennies. They're not even pennies. You're not making anything on it anymore. You can't buy it anywhere. You're actually doesn't, losing um, money on chasing after these people. Doesn't Stop Moby being Games? Idiots. Doesn't Moby Games have like a huge archive? Like, wouldn't they be affected by this? They may well be. Uh, the yeah. Internet Archive has put up thousands of old retro games from platforms that don't ex- even exist anymore. Although, thankfully, in some cases, those companies don't exist anymore, so there's no one left to sue you. But it's just, it's ridiculous. Seriously, at some point, you've got to let go. Let it go. Let's all sing If you together. love it, let no. it go. Let it go. Let it free your body. Let it free your let soul. Go. Anyway... Uh, my pick. Yeah, I know you were going for the Beatles. <sighs> sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. So as I was uh, explaining uh, earlier in the uh, the first part of the podcast, you probably may or may not have heard I got a new printer this week. Uh, it's been forever and a day. It was an I've old. I've seen a H- brother on fire before. This brother's on fire. It, it literally caught fire. The the accountant was shocked. It was. Still a highlight of my IT career. That's awesome. Uh, my old one was an HP 940C. Just ancient, ancient, ancient. Didn't even work anymore at the time. So I figured it was it was time to spend the scratch. And uh, I'd had uh, some experience with some of the brother printers at work. And uh, this one has pretty much got it all. For 129 bucks. it's a pretty high-end printer. It can scan nice, fax, all those all in one function. Oh god, you want for an MFC too? Mm. What? A multifunction? It, it, it sucks at everything. No, it it actually does really well. It even handles eleven by seventeen tabloid. It'll scan that. Well, it won't scan that. No, uh, yeah, no, it won't scan that. But it'll, uh, but it will print eleven by seventeen. So should we start the countdown until you? start having IT issues with that printer like not being able to see it like print queue issues because those still totally exist uh, you know well, what I got a phone call today it'll be tomorrow morning Yeah, the past 10 I, years my entire IT experience has been printers on a daily basis yeah. I don't think we're yeah. ever going to get away with that especially on an enterprise network I've it still just, got an HP LJ 2100 thing only bitches about paper jams and ink changes Nothing else. Yeah, but the ink Nothing itself else. is not horrific for that. And plus, uh, you know, it's not like one of the HP cartridges, which are all three colors in one and then a black and white. All the three other individual colors other than black are separate. So you replace what you need. When well, you need it. I doubt it'll print without one of the CMYK. Like, even if it doesn't need that color, I bet it won't print without it. So you're gonna to have to replace it once it's empty. Well, yeah, yep. yeah, but yeah, they usually the air out. And they won't. Like if you That's just want to put, if you just want to put, print black and white, and you don't have cyan, it will make you replace the cyan. So, but here's then a you kicker. only have to replace the cyan. Yeah, but then you're replacing. Yeah, but it's usually a three pack, so yeah. you got to replace all. Of them. Here's here's a real kicker for you guys: uh, Canon MX922 printer. If it's out of ink, it's a multifunction printer. You can't scan. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> this wow, is that's, correct. Oh, that's nice. God, I hate it's printers. This is not. This is not. No. Uh, yeah. I, at work, it would still print black and white when one of the color inks oh, was well, gone. That's good. That seems pretty rare with the CMYK multicolor stuff. Yeah. No. I mean, it's it's four different colors that you can pop out individually, and so mm-hmm. you know you buy the one pack and the three pack, and I don't know. Anyway, uh, you know, inkjet obviously is is a scam in the end, and you're paying more than you probably should. But at least this is less of a scam than I've experienced in the past. Yeah, at least you're not buying the print head every time you get new ink. Exactly. And that's a little bit more expensive. Gee, I'd rather pay $70 instead of 140 for <laughs> yeah. the yeah. entire thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Can yeah. you only shove it to the knuckle instead of the whole... <laughs> Pretty much what they're asking. 
Yeah, pretty not much. Not a fan of printers. <laughs> yeah. Speaking so of printers. So, Alan, speaking of printer ink. Speaking of printers. Well, before I get to the ink, uh, the printhead for that same Canon MX922 printer costs more than the printer. Oh, yeah. Uh, just thought I'd let you know. You might as well just get that <sighs> breaks. You might as well just get another printer. Um, so, while you're on the whole printer topic, uh, I should just remind everybody that's listening that, like, if you have to buy a whole round of ink that's very expensive for these cartridges, if you do some looking around, you can find stuff like what I linked there, which is just happens to be for my printer. There are people out there that make these aftermarket cartridges that you can refill. So, usually you have to get some kind of special cartridges because the printer companies are kind of, you know, I don't know what term to even use for them, but they put this whole DRM chip crap in their cartridges so that when they actually run out, like, there's no way to, you know, there's no way to get them back after that point. Like, the chip just says, no, thou shalt not print. So, there are places that make uh, cartridges with just what's called, like, reset chips, which basically still has to count down some arbitrary number as if the cartridge was getting empty, uh, except once it gets all the way empty, you can just, like, you know... Uh, unplug the cartridge just like as if you were going to remove it but just enough to disconnect the connection push it back in and it basically resets the chip back to full so you do you do still have to refill the cartridge as well but like you know it's uh it's a workaround and it lets you get away with like like that thing i linked there that refill kit which you can refill those cartridges like eight or ten times with the amount of ink that they give you i mean it's like just a huge you know uh, vials of ink compared to uh, the size of the cartridge can can hold, um, and just you get that many refills out of it. Like? And, and it, and it's like the cost of just what would what you would pay on a single round of cartridges from the manufacturer. So, yeah, don't don't pay more in weight and in ink than you would for gold uh, or do blood it this, or blood. Do it this other way. Uh, you know, you have to. You might make a little bit of a mess if you're not very coordinated and you spill stuff. Maybe this is not for you, but if you're able to handle that, then do this. Very nice. I will have to look into that and see if that is available for mine brother. Uh, Sebastian, your pick. My pick is a small and inexpensive laptop. It's the Asus eBook X205TA. This is $199. You can get it just a little bit less on Amazon. I picked up the Microsoft Signature Edition, so it has no junk wear or trial wear or anything on it, and it was the same price. But this is a quad-core Intel Bay Trail powered, so it's an Atom CPU. And if you run down the specs, there's nothing really exceptional here. It looks like a Chromebook as far as the specifications go, but it's running Windows 8.1 with Bing. So there is a license, a full version of Windows 8.1 on here. And I've been using this thing for about a week and a half. And it's there's some trade-offs, of course, because of the price with the, some of the hardware they use. But it's actually a very interesting product. And I may or may not have just completed a review that you'll see Maybe. shortly. Hmm. Nice. We like inexpensive laptops. With Bing. <clears throat> Bing is the best part. Exactly. So that's our podcast for tonight. It went a little bit longer than usual, which is not really surprising considering who we are. Uh, you can come and check out these podcasts at pcpro.com slash podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, twitter.com slash Ryan Trout, twitter.com slash pcper, and of course, subscribe, pcpro.com slash subscribe. Check us out. We, we have a lot to offer, and we don't charge a whole lot. But you do have to have some patience to go through some of Alan's SSD things. But that's peanuts as compared. So, with that, we wish you a good night. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Alan Malentano. I'm Sebastian Peake. And the monkey behind the screen is Ken. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> <laughs>